Hello, welcome back to Catholic Reboot. This episode is around conversion to the Catholic Church. And um, what's kind of interesting is I will have uh, friends that are uh, not Catholic, um, or I'll have friends that are Catholic and kind of fallen away. And uh, when it comes to conversion, it's... Um, there's really nothing new under the sun, to be honest with you, in the way of the spirit of why someone wants to convert. And I want to go through what those uh, those reasons are, right? But first of all, I had promised that I would go through what we call the uh, Trinitum, or the Paschal Trinitum, which is uh, during Holy Week up until Easter, right? So, you know, I will cover that in great detail. So it's those three days. That's why it's called the, the Trinitum. But uh, so we're talking Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil on Saturday. And then, voila, we're into the celebration of Easter. But those three, three days are so critical as a Catholic, right? It, that's when we're really doing the final heavy lifting. What, what most people do don't know or may have forgotten is that when it came to converts uh, they would take a full 12 months of the year to prepare to become Catholic and on Holy Saturday or the Easter Vigil was the acceptance of the converts into the Catholic Church right so we know that uh, the catechumens could participate in the celebration of the Mass but it had to leave right after the sermon and before the Apostles' Creed, right? Because the rest of the Mass <clears throat> is uh, for uh, Catholics, right? There was a big reason they did that. That that got significantly relaxed, again, since Vatican II. Don't want to go there. I'm going to just tell you uh, the traditional view of conversion and when it takes place. Now, uh, the interesting part is if I... if if a Protestant, well, let me not let me not categorize it that way. Let me say a non-Catholic, uh, or even a fallen away Catholic, they would say, well, why would anybody want to convert to the Catholic Church, or why should I? Let's say they're asking the question in earnest, why why should I convert to the Catholic Church? My honest response is, well, if you want to come to the Catholic Church under the Novus Ordo, don't waste your time where you're at you're probably okay okay now that sounds really harsh but if you listen to the words from even pope francis he's saying that conversion is not a catholic's primary concern right and he he refers more to work on your own soul and don't necessarily uh take it upon yourself to convert others to the faith that, that is such a significant de uh, departure from the Catholic Church. I don't even want to go there. I just know one thing. If he would have put that in an encyclical, he would probably be real close to material heresy. But again, they don't do that. They don't actually uh, take the, the official position. It's the statements that are always made. All right. Now, why do I say that? If we as Catholics believe the Catholic Church is the one holy apostolic church, right? We believe that. We don't just pay lip service to it. What greater love can we have for others than to want them to share in the true church, in, in Christ's true church, right? We wouldn't. We would, we would be seeking the salvation of their soul, and we would rush them in to be Catholic, right? Now, there, there's some, and I'll go through the steps for anybody that wants to know how do I go through a conversion process or what are those steps that I need to go through. But before we talk about that, there's actually some psychological reasons, okay? Um, especially today. Um, there's the first is what they call an authority hunger that people are seeking today, right? So uh, we live in a time of a lot of broken homes, broken families, stepbrothers, sisters, and there's this sense of who is my authority? And I've seen it with friends. 
all of a sudden a new father enters the picture the biological chains are broke uh, the the paternal instinct isn't the same and the poor child is saying is he my father is he my father is she my mother and this authority hunger is one of the greatest needs people have now those that may not come from a broken family in our society today are still looking for this this need for paternity and maternity right so what is it that the catholic church has always taught us this perfect family right so we model ourselves after the holy family right so um you, you'll hear Catholics uh, refer to uh, the church as the mother church, right? And we there's great emphasis on the Blessed Virgin, right? And what she means to us as a mother. And then at the same time, we're referring to the Pope as Papa, right, or Father. Um, and there's this emphasis on the, the priest, the male figures of the priest we call Father as well, right? Now, all this started to slowly get pushed out of the Catholic Church after Vatican II. And it is very telling, just in this one instance, this hunger for authority, <coughs> conversion started to tank after Vatican II. The Church wasn't setting itself up as an authority on much of anything anymore, right? they no longer got involved in setting the standards. Everything was kind of uh, what you feel. You know, a good friend uh, of mine, uh, right after Palm Sunday Mass, we were having breakfast, and she had said uh, what drives her crazy, right, is that uh, when you'll hear statements like, no, no, you do you, right? No, you just do you. And she made a real good point. She said, what's that mean? Is is something true and something false? Or is everything can be true and everything can be false? And she reflected on her father who said, I am, I'm not following uh, anything but the truth, right? That started to wane as well. And so these things like you do you, you know, or you go do that thing that you do do so well, that's that's a cultural fact of this lack of authority that they've been witnessing in the church, right? The other thing, and you may hear this from certain uh, non-Catholics, there's what they call a holiness uh, defect order. There's this idea that um, we're, losing, we're losing sight of this awe of God, right? Um, if, if you, a lot of the Protestant churches, um, there's this sense of the very presence of the Almighty, uh, but there isn't this falling before his throne and crying out, I am not worthy of you, O Lord. You won't hear that. You know, it's that, oh, I am worthy. I was born again. I'm saved. But at the same time, they become their own enemy, Right. I mean, if you look at Revelations 5, 11, it says, Were there are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So in, in essence, the Protestantism became kind of a victim of its own success, breaking away from the one holy Catholic, Catholic apostolic church, because... Um, taking the the power of the gospel and emphasizing it which was this whole scriptural narrative that martin luther was claiming they were in essence kind of stripping out the awe of it at the same time so eventually uh they became accustomed to uh you know the shocking notion that the holy god could pardon filthy sinners and that we forgot that anything uh, was particularly odd about it, right? So rather than uh, standing, you know, somewhat confidently before, uh, before him clothed in the righteousness of God, as we would say, or righteousness of Christ, you'll see this, this somewhat Protestant effect that kind of permeated into the Catholic Church. You'll see people walking, walking in 
somewhat callously uh, or casually into church, you know, wearing gym shorts, you know, and a latte in their hand or something. This sense of awe is 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 gone, right? And I think even the Protestants or those that convert say, you know, the thing about the Catholic Church that was so appealing was when you'd walk into their church, you felt the sanctity of the church, the aweness, right? All right, so um, that that there is a psychological sense to conversion, and um, and and you want you want to walk through that as as someone going through this ecstasy, I call it, of of conversion, or maybe even call it conversionitis, right? It's it's this idea that there's a reason you're defecting. You're looking for something that's a little bit more persuasive, right? And and something that's going to pro- provide that awe uh, in your transition. Otherwise, as I said earlier, why would you convert, right? I, I promised I wasn't going to bash the Novus Ordo, but I wouldn't. I would. I, I couldn't understand why anybody would want to convert to Novus Ordo Catholic. Surely the sense of awe is gone. Uh, the blending of the Protestant faith into the Catholic faith has made it nothing but uh, what I call Catholic light. Uh, and I dare say, in certain cases, I see certain Protestant faiths that probably have much more awe in their celebration than the Novus Ordo, right? So um, when we when we look forward and we say, okay, what are these key psychological drivers? It's one, the, the hunger for authority in our lives. Uh, the other thing is that we're, we're searching for something that's missing, missing in our, our sense of um, awness. God is great, okay? And so we notice this defect in this holiness in our life, right? There's this big hole in us. Finally, there's, there's what uh, is called the inner ring. And for any of those that know C.S. Lewis, he had written an essay called The Inner Ring, right? And what the essay was about was this, this need for something bigger and better, right? More influential, more sophisticated, uh, more inspiring. And what, what many converts had noticed prior to conversion is there was this kind of aura among, let's say, traditional Catholics practicing the faith. It was kind of a, a wink and a nudge that they're, they're sharing in something great, right? And uh, Lewis had said, uh, this desire is one of the great permanent mainsprings of human action, right? Unless you take measures to prevent it, this desire is going to be one of the chief motives of your life from the first day on which you enter your profession until the day you are too old to care. And that's really, that's really a very uh, great way of explaining why would we not want that? Why would we not want that feeling of being in that inner ring? And I'd like to say the inner ring is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the Catholic church, right? All right. So that's it's a long preface to what I want to talk about. And I want to get back to what steps are necessary before someone is accepted into the Catholic Church on Holy Saturday, the Easter Vigil, right? Um, first, and I had maybe said this in a previous episode, you want to... Uh, first go through the steps of why is it I want to convert you know and just take down uh, take down a piece of paper and start writing it down I mean really take the time turn off the television and say what is it that's making me feel I want to convert right and have that kind of that serious talk with yourself before you take the first step, I think because what that is, I'd like to refer to it as a conversion business plan. You're writing down the reasons for a conversion. And like a business plan, if when you're done, you review it and you say, it's just not compelling, you're probably not ready for a conversion. Just like 
in a business plan, you're probably not ready to start a business, right? I know it's very uh, accountant of me, but it does have the same type of parallel. If you can't sell yourself in your marketing theme of your convergent business plan, uh, you're not going to be able to lie to yourself. It's going to fall apart. So that first step is very important. You know, it's not like making a decision to checking the donor box on your driver's license, you know. I mean, this is a significant decision you're going to you're going to make in your life, right? Now, um the the next step is and I had talked about this in in other episodes. Get a good traditional book on Catholic catechism. And if you want me to refer one, I will. I actually put it in a placard at the end. I mean, I've always referred to the Baltimore Catechism because it was very succinct. Uh, to take a real deep dive, it's probably the Catechism of, uh, that came out of the Council of Trent. I think for those coming over right now, the Baltimore Catechism is sufficient. I think as you practice your faith and become stronger in your Catholicism, then it's a good idea to go to the Catechism of Trent. Right. The next reason would be uh, to to better understand your circumstances. If if you have no history in the Catholic Church, right, um, you're going to need to go through the process of the initiation. And most of it, most converts, of course, are adults, so it's going to be initiation into the church uh, for adults. Um, but if you uh, been baptized and nothing else, right? You have no other ties to your to the church or any other church. It'd probably be a little bit different, um, because then there's going to be another step. And I I'd like to say understanding the Catechism of the Catholic Church is a good precursor to that. The next thing you really need to do, and I had I put a uh, a URL link on my previous videos um, pointing out good traditional Catholic churches I would say you should pick one you know I've always in the Chicago area I always point to St. John Cantus because uh, it, to me it's just the perfect setting uh, for someone to get their first intro introduction to the Catholic Church and I would go okay um, and I would simply observe now I've I've spoken to you in in, in the past um, that uh, to to really truly understand you you get this whole experience of seeing what's going on. Would I say you should have a, a a missile with you and following along? No, I think first what you do is you're going to pick that church to go to. You find out when their mass is, then you attend the mass. It would probably be even better that you would go with a friend to sit uh, next to you and you can observe what that person is doing, right? You don't need to do it, but you need to observe, right? What you're going to notice when you attend a traditional Catholic Mass is, number one, the awe of it all, the, the respect for the Holy Eucharist, the silence what I also like to call the smells and the bells, right? The bells initiating those key points of the Mass, uh, the smells of the incense uh, uh, during, uh, during the consecration of the altar or the blessing of the altar uh, prior to the consecration. All this comes into you. You, when you. When you practice Catholic faith, you're practicing all your senses, right? But what you may notice that if you're with a friend that is following the Mass through a Missal, from the moment the Mass starts all the way to the very end, your friend is praying. And this is something that's been lost in the Novus Ordo Mass. People will have a, what they call a Missalette. It's a, it's a thin book that just allows them to know when to respond to the priest, right? And there may be some prayers in there, but the real missile of the Mass is prayers. And quite honestly, when I, I'd like to call myself a convert, even though I was raised, I was born and raised Catholic, 
I came up to the Novus Ordo Church in 2000. I'd like to say I converted to the real Catholic Church, the traditional Catholic Church, right? And um, the big difference for me was, oh my gosh, I am so involved in this Mass. I am praying along through the whole process that uh, if you if you go to a, a Novus Ordo Mass, you'll see people going, hmm. They're just distracted. They're just looking around, right? When you're celebrating the traditional Mass, you have no time. It's You have to keep up in the Mass. You are praying through the Mass. And what ends up happening is it, it infuses itself in you. And so what you're not doing is you're not willy-nilly showing up at any time. You're not leaving early. Why? Because you're practicing the Mass. You're praying the Mass. And you believe me, you're never bored because it's a job to participate in the Mass, right? Sorry, I always go off on those tangents, but it's, it is so beautiful. Uh, uh, on Palm Sunday, uh, you just, uh, most people were staying for two hours because uh, they not only uh, stayed through the Mass and the procession, but the Vespers of the priest afterwards because you hear this beautiful choir. You don't want to leave. You're like in this sacred place. You're like, I know once I go out there, I'm back into the secular world that's given me no deposits, right? All right, so then the next step is to pray. Okay, so we as Catholics always say, before you do anything, you pray on it, right? Well, I would say the most important thing for anyone that's going to convert to the faith is take time out of your day for at least one month prior to even starting uh, into your uh, into your actual work of conversion and pray. Uh, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. Uh, it's not that you're looking for any answers when you pray in this way. You're just uh, you're 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 like talking to someone up there, you know, the saints included, to to say I need guidance, right? Because everything's going to enter into your life, especially the devil, to keep you from doing that. And so when you're praying, you're not only praying to say help me. Uh, make the decision on my conversion, but help guard me through the conversion process, right? All right, so let's say now you're ready. You say, I really am ready for this. Um, contact the, the parish office at the church, right? And uh, simply ask for a meeting with a priest and uh, ask about their pre-catechumenate process. You know, what what is necessary what you're going to need to go through, right? But I emphasize talk to a priest because the priest will ask you why. You know, the priest is probably the best litmus test of uh, walking you through what this conversion is going to consist of and what they want. The thing that I am reluctant to do with anyone that wants to convert is I'm more than happy to be a friend in the process but I do not want to be part of their conversion. Okay, that that is reserved to a priest because a priest uh, has the skills to know where is this person at, right? You'll get quite a few people saying, read this book and do this. And it, a priest knows uh, the temperament of this person, knows what they should be reading, what they should not be reading, what steps are necessary. I think the concern I would have is I could blow a good conversion by infusing too much of myself in that process, right? So what the priest is going to do is going to start you in this Catholic education, right? And then uh, once you're complete, you complete this entire season, uh, there is a sponsor assigned, okay, to help you get through it. Then they, you have what they call the beginning period of purification and enlightenment. Okay, so uh, once the end of liturgical cycle is close, this is the part where you're preparing for the three public celebrations, right? The rite of election, uh, uh, the call to continued conversion, 
and then this this is the deal clincher okay this is the easter vigil right you're in okay uh now the first two are listed at the beginning of lent when the 40 days are up at the easter vigil you will be baptized confirmed and receive the eucharist now you're a full-fledged catholic uh, after the Easter Vigil, right? Now, um, the the interesting part is um, some people say, well, I thought you had to be born Catholic. Like, to, in order to be truly of the Jewish faith, your mother had to be Jewish, right? And, you know, you'll hear people saying they, they converted to Judaism, but in the strict observance of the Mosaic Law, it has to, mother has to be Jewish. A lot of people feel that um, the only way you could become a Catholic is to be born a Catholic. Totally not true. Matter of fact, the Catholic Church was created out of conversions all through its history, right? What I have noticed is um, some converts are stronger than lifelong practicing Catholics and are inspirational to lifelong Catholics. They tend to bring back that sense of awe that Catholics have lost. Okay, but there is one one issue I do find. I find some uh, converts, especially uh, Protestants, thinking they know better or know more. They like to challenge Catholics, like, "Well, wh you were fortunate enough to have this your whole life. How dare you?" I, I would say uh, for those Protestant converts, chill out a little bit. Remember, we've been doing this for a very long time. Don't presuppose where our level of spiritualness is. Um, I've even seen it with priests that converted from Protestantism or were Baptists that became priests. They tend to kind of set themselves up as better experts because in their formations they were more serious. What I like to remind them is that when they were still practicing their faith, uh, I was out there defending mine during the turbulent years of the 70s through the 90s so give me a little bit of a break for towing the line when when they were still practicing in their baptist their baptist faith and um, uh, protestant faith all right but you know i hope i never come off as a haughty catholic because i never mean to do it i think the confusion is i'm a proud catholic and you've heard my previous episodes i always say we've got the gold bar compared to a tin bar we've got to go out there and and let everybody know there's gold here and you really do want to be part of this um the conversion of of sinners and the conversion uh, of the faithful is probably the greatest obligation we as catholics have do you know that otherwise we're selfish in our faith we're saying well i got mine you know um we, and that's why I w was really disappointed in Pope Francis saying it's not a priority for a Catholic. It, matter of fact, it is absolutely one of our top priorities. Uh, if you look at what Christ said to the, the apostles, go out, all right, and spread my word. He didn't say, oh, just get a couple people together in the town and, you know, if the others don't want to know, no. Matter of fact, Christ even took it further. He said, go out and seek them, and if they don't hear, thus the dust the dirt off your sandals and move on but the priority was to go seek them out so i'm not really sure what where pope francis is coming from but i will say the one thing that will never change there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the conversion process in the sense that people are seeking christ and they're seeking the one holy catholic apostolic church They've been doing it for 2,000 years. All we're doing is just continuing these deposits of faith, okay? All right, so I thought that was important and hope this wasn't too long, which it probably was. Um, happy conversion. This is something I forgot to put in this, uh, this episode that was really important. First thing is, I don't know why the subscribe button isn't working very well. Uh, I've had previous uh, podcasts and it was easy enough, but for some reason they're complicating it. The other thing is the end notes is much more difficult for me to post things. So until I figure that out, I'm going to put um, 
the actual link to my playlist. If you think anything is worth passing on to friends or family, just give them that link. Uh, and until I can get it figured out, it's there. The other thing is, um, and I, I'm hoping to have just a subscribe button like you used to have at the bottom of the, the screen. Uh, the other thing is I didn't mention in this uh, in this whole episode on conversion uh, most people don't realize that 28 of the first uh, 31 popes were martyred were killed right so if if we don't think conversion is that important in in the new Novus Ordo church that's kind of saying what these popes went through wasn't necessary right so um and think about the time span. So from the time of Peter, the first pope, which was 67 AD, all the way to 984 AD, which is 924 years, these popes, uh, when taking the seat of Peter, knew they were going to be murdered, right, and martyred. So it's a very important point, not to mention the countless number of faithful who died, the early Christians that were martyred in the Colosseum. These were great acts of not only faith, but conversion. They converted and knew it was almost immediate death. Boy, how much more should we take the importance of our conversion today? And if we are practicing Catholics, like I said before, maybe we need to reconvert in our faith to really understand the beautiful deposits. Okay, that's officially the end.